What is good, TMG fam? Huh? One of the most requested. Did I say that word right? One of the most requested channels to check out for me. Like y'all have been at me to check out this channel. Mr. Ballin. Like, I didn't know what this was, but after, like, it's been on my list. I just hadn't had a chance to get to it. I was eventually going to get to it, but y'all were relentless. I have to hand it to y'all, bro. Y'all were relentless at making sure I remember to get to this channel, man. And Mr. Ballin, like, I thought it was like some N1 street ball type Mr. Professor hot sauce or you know, I thought it was some of that type of stuff. I thought it was sports related, but no. No, 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 no. So we here, man. We finally here, all right? So the video we checking out, this is one of the most recent ones he's done. Um, not the recent one, but one of the most recent ones he's done. It's, it's called This Man Died 37 Times. <laughs> that's, a, that's a heck of a title, bro. This man died 37 times, like... How does that, how is that even possible, bro? So we're going to get to this video, man. If you Google the crazy, hold on, hold on. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. I'm setting up while I'm setting up. You hit the subscribe button and go ahead and hit the like button. Cause I'm here. You got to give me a like for that period. All right, let's check them out. If you Google the craziest war story of all time, the story I'm gonna tell today always pops up as the number one. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please remove all of the trash bags from inside all of the like button's trash cans and then proceed to throw away various perishable saucy food items. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Born in South Texas in 1935, Roy Benavidez was orphaned as a young child and sent to live with his uncle. As a young teen, he had to drop out of school to work in the beet and cotton fields just to help support his family. When he turned 18, he decided he wanted to get away from his hometown and do something bigger with his life, and so he enlisted in the army, and shortly after that, he went to airborne school and then was assigned to the very famous 82nd Airborne Division. In October of 1964, Roy was a part of the first 125,000 Americans sent to Vietnam. While on a classified operation that required Roy to dress up as an enemy combatant, he stepped on a landmine in the middle of the jungle and nobody else was with him, so he's totally stranded. But fortunately, a squad of US Marines came upon him, but from what he was wearing, they assumed he was an enemy soldier, and so they almost walked past him, but someone thought to just flip him over and see who he was, and they discovered he was American, and he had American dog tags on. And so he was evacuated from Vietnam and sent to an American hospital, and there, a doctor would tell him that he had a serious spinal injury and that it was unlikely he would ever walk again. And Roy's first reaction was, please don't discharge me from the army. Because for Roy, the army was his life. It was all he had. He was incredibly proud of it. And he desperately wanted to go back to Vietnam. And so he pleaded with the doctors and the nurses, please let me have some time to try to regain my strength in my legs so that I don't get medically discharged. And so they said, look, you're going to get medically retired if you aren't walking within the year. And so every night when his doctors and nurses would leave, he would fall out of his bed and then drag himself across the ground to the wall and then he'd pull himself up and try to put weight on his legs and attempt to build strength back up and retrain himself how to walk and after six months of doing this every night he did literally reteach himself how to walk he built up strength in his legs and his doctors and nurses they're watching this transformation during the day but they're not seeing him at night and they're telling him this is a miracle we've never seen this before we've never seen someone recover so quickly and Roy just stayed quiet because he wanted to make sure he was allowed to keep doing that every night. And so finally, after those six months, his doctors and nurses agreed that, yep, he's good. He can stay in the army. But the army said they wanted him to take a desk job because he had already been so badly wounded in combat. And Roy didn't want that. He 
Can't give a guy like that a desk job, man. It just, it's, it's not gonna work, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Certain people just, it's just not about that life. Pleaded with them to let him go back to the 82nd, but they said, no, we're not gonna risk you getting hurt again. And so he was sent to North Carolina for his desk job. And as soon as he got there, he began training like a maniac every minute of every day, trying to get in the best shape of his life because his plan in his head was once he got there, he would try out for special forces. He would try to become an army green beret, which is the premier combat unit in the army. It's one of the hardest ones to get into. And their training program is in North Carolina. Carolina. And so after a few months, he was in amazing shape and he asked his superiors, can I go try out to be a Green Beret? And they're like, I can't believe you're even walking, but you know what? You've come this far, you can go try out. And just a couple of months later, Roy Benavides was a Green Beret. A year later in 1968, so four years after Roy was nearly killed by that landmine, he was sent back to Vietnam for his second combat tour. And as soon as he got there, the fighting was very intense. On May 2nd of that year, Roy had a day off and he was spending his day off at a church service inside of their wooden shack they had built on their base. And while he was in there listening to the chaplain, he heard a radio call come out from the communications table that was just outside of the shack he was in. And it sounded like someone was in trouble. And so he ran outside to listen to the radio and what he heard was this very desperate call from someone yelling into the radio get us out of here and in the background of this radio call is just a constant barrage of gunfire the call for help came from a 12-man army special forces team that had been ambushed by an entire north vietnamese army infantry battalion to put that in perspective that is 12 special forces members of which many of them roy knew personally in the middle of the jungle, where on all four sides, there are over 1,000 enemy combatants. As Roy is hearing this distressing transmission come across the radio, he hears overhead the sound of incoming helicopters. And he looks and he sees there's three birds that are coming towards their base. And so he runs over to the landing zone to greet the helicopters as they come in. And he can see as they're landing, they are all completely covered in bullet holes. And as soon as they touch down, Roy runs up to one of the door gunners, which is this 19 year old kid. And he looks kind of dazed and Roy asks, him, you know, what's going on? Where'd you guys just come from? Were you out there at that ambush site? Do you know what's going on with that 12 man team? And the door gunner just collapses into Roy's arms and dies. He had been shot up. Dang. These three helicopters had attempted previously to fly into the jungle and save that 12 man team, but they had been shot off and had been unsuccessful. Roy helped get the dead door gunner out of the helo. And then he turned to the pilot of this helo where the door gunner was. And he asked him, you know, are you going to go back out there and try to save those guys? And the pilot was obviously so distraught about the death of his door gunner and also the fact that there are 12 men out there that they could not rescue that he's chomping at the bit he wants to go back out there and Roy immediately volunteers hops in the helo and they head out to go rescue this 12 man team so not only are there only two of them but Roy was so eager to volunteer himself he forgot his gun so all he had on him was his knife and some medical supplies but nonetheless, the pilot just keeps flying towards the ambush site, which was in Cambodia. There was this really dense stretch of jungle. And as they got closer and closer, gunfire started coming out of the jungle towards the helicopter. And so the pilot had to do this kind of constant zigzagging just to avoid getting shot down. And so as they're zigzagging, they notice there's some smoke coming out of the jungle. And it was very clear that this 12 man team is trying to signal to the helo, here we are, come get us, because they can hear the helicopters coming in. And so the pilot tried to fly down and get as close as he could, but but any time he got even marginally close to this team, the rate of fire would pick up so dramatically that the helo was just about to get shot down. And so the pilot began to turn away and he told Roy, we can't get any closer. We're gonna have to get more people in here. And Roy just tells him, no, get as low as you can and I will jump out into the jungle. And the pilot turns to him and he's like, you can't do that, you're gonna get killed. And Roy somehow convinces this pilot that he alone, without a gun, is totally competent. Just put me down in that jungle and everything's gonna be just fine. And so the pilot said, okay, and he lowered right over the canopy of this jungle about 100 yards away from where this 12-man team is trapped. And without any hesitation, Roy just leaps off the helicopter into the jungle. Now, you got to understand that where he was jumping was where the enemy was. He was literally jumping, no parachute, no gun, no anything, just crashing through the canopy onto the jungle floor where he'll definitely be surrounded by baddest man ever right now already can see it bro this is the baddest man ever bro imagine if he was still alive to tell his own story bro i'd be sitting there just just like that bro like like locked in 
enemy combatants. And so he plummets through the canopy, smashes onto the ground, he pops up and just starts running through the jungle with enemies on either side of him towards the 12 man down team. They gotta have a movie out about this guy. Like you can't not make a movie about this type of person. And the enemy was so surprised to just see this American running through the middle of the jungle by himself with no weapon that they hesitated for a minute and they didn't open fire on him. But when they did open fire, Roy got shot in the face, in the back Ooh. of the head, in the leg. They threw a grenade that detonated at his back and sent shrapnel into him. But none of it stopped Roy. He just kept on running until he made it to this downed 12 man team. And when he got to them, they were in terrible shape. They were doing their best to stay behind some trees, but rounds were coming in from all directions and four of them were already dead and the others that were still alive were critically wounded. In fact, one of the most able-bodied of the surviving 12 had been shot in the head and was missing an eye and could barely see out of the other one. And so he's fighting to stay conscious and he's generally trying to shoot in one direction. But I mean, that's their best guy at this point to give you a state of how they were doing. But Roy ran up to this guy, he pulled him down, he gave him a shot of morphine in the arm and he repositioned him because he couldn't really see and told him where to shoot his gun. And then under a constant... Like all the while, let's not forget he's been shot in the face, blown in the back with shrapnel, all kind of gunfire he's taken. And he's able to like, yo, yo. Hail of bullets, Roy low crawled to each of the other living team members and gave them morphing shots and then began dragging each and every one of them away from the ambush site to this other area where there was better cover and there was a nearby clearing that he believed a helicopter could land in if the pilot was really daring. On one of Roy's last trips back to the ambush site to get the last few surviving members, he saw two other men that were part of this team that had been totally cut off from the main group. And when Roy had jumped into the jungle and ran in, all his adrenaline had kicked up and he just hadn't done a head count. And so he didn't realize there were two other people over there. And so without any hesitation, he grabbed a gun off of one of the dead enemy soldiers and just began running towards this downed two-man team. And as he's running, he's shooting wildly in every direction, trying his best to suppress enemy fire, but it's really doing nothing. He's just dodging bullets as he's running. And right as he got close to the two-man team, a bullet went flying through his thigh, just clean through his thigh, and it didn't slow him down. He got to the two-man team totally unfazed. And he said, no way, no, no way, no way, no way, no way, no way, no way through his face, thigh, back. Like it's covered every part of his body at this point. Like he's been hidden and he's still going, bro. Yo. He says, okay, get ready to move. He stands back up and he starts shooting again in both directions and tells them to crawl back to the main unit. And so he stands up and continues to shoot in both directions until these two men get back over to the main group. Once they were safely with the group, Roy again ran the gauntlet with this huge gaping hole in his thigh all the way back to the main group. And so now that Roy had a full head count of all of the living members of the downed 12 man team, and he had moved them all to this slightly safer area relatively with better cover and concealment, he threw a smoke grenade into the nearby clearing he had found in hopes that the helo pilot overhead would see the smoke and be willing to come down and land. The pilot that had dropped off Roy had not actually left the area. He had moved away from all the fighting, but he was loitering in case something like this happened. And so he saw the smoke and without any hesitation, he flew right over taking rounds the whole time, pinging off the side of his helicopter and he touched down right in this tiny little clearing. And so as the semi able-bodied surviving members of this unit begin making their way over to the helicopter, Roy began running around a little ways off from the helicopter, picking up rifles off of the dead enemy and shooting back at the enemy, dropping that gun, running over, picking up another one, engaging the enemy over and over again, doing everything he can to try to protect the extract of his men behind him. And once Roy turned around and saw most of the men had made it onto the helicopter, Roy believed it was his chance now to run out and try to collect some of their dead teammates. And so Roy just takes off into the jungle, right into enemy fire. He's got two guns in his hands and he's running. He's trying to engage the enemy as he's going. And then he comes across the first of his dead teammates. And it happens to be one of his very best friends, a man named Leroy Wright. And so he grabs Leroy and begins trying to haul him back towards the chopper. And as he's moving, Roy gets shot again, this time through his stomach. 
So he tries to keep himself on his feet, and as he's doing that, a grenade detonates behind him, sending more shrapnel into his body, knocking him unconscious. When he came to, he started looking around, and he could see in the tree line dozens of enemy soldiers running towards him. And so he knew if he tried to bring Leroy back to the chopper, that was a suicide mission. And so he had to leave his friend behind. He jumped up, and with all of these enemy combatants just constantly engaging him, he ran all the way back, zigging and zagging back to the main group. And when he got there, expecting to see the helicopter, Helicopter, he found the helicopter had actually crashed onto the ground and was on fire. It had been shot down while he was unconscious. And so he ran over to the flaming shell of this helicopter and he saw the pilot had been killed, but some of the men that had climbed on, the men that he had just rescued, they had survived the crash and subsequent explosion. And so Roy just leaps into the burning vehicle and starts throwing these survivors out. But then he leapt back out, he picked up a gun, continued to engage the enemy, and then began picking up these wounded men and dragging them even farther away to another area that was safely away from this crash site because he knew if he didn't get all these people away from the crash site pretty soon mortars are going to come raining down on this area because their enemy is going to want to kill any of the people that are going to try to rescue the people that were on the helicopter and so roy finally gets all of the survivors over to this new area and he's looking around and he can see there are still hundreds of enemy fighters that are not that far away from them just constantly engaging them and roy's doing his best to grab guns off the ground and shoot the enemy but there's just too many of them and he's looking around at his team and everybody's on the brink of death and so is Roy he's just functioning on adrenaline at this point and he thinks to himself the only way we can get out of this is if we call in what's called a danger close airstrike so what you need to understand about how airstrikes work in a combat zone is there's someone called a controller that is on the ground directing the aircraft overhead they're the ones effectively telling the plane where to shoot and so a danger close airstrike is when the controller tells the aircraft overhead, I want you to drop a bomb right here, giving them the grid coordinates, but where they're telling them to drop is basically in the same position where the controller is. And you'd only do it if you're being overrun. It's a way to ensure your enemy gets taken out, even if that means taking yourself out. Now, the goal of the controller is not to drop the bomb on themselves or their team. The goal of the controller is to get that airstrike as close as you can to your position without killing you. And so Roy, who's physically wrecked, he's getting shot at, he's got bullet holes all over him, it's totally chaotic. He pulls out his map, he calmly finds his grid coordinates, he calls it into the aircraft overhead, and he calls in a beautiful precision napalm strike that does not affect his team at all. He calls in multiple gun runs. None of them affect his team, despite them all being considered. Yo, this dude is legendary, bro. This dude is lit all while being shot up, blown up, everything, all while rescuing everybody, still manages to comprehend where he's at, gather his coordinates, man, and continue to wreck shop, bro. This dude here is legendary as an understatement danger close airstrikes and so roy just continuously called in attack run after attack run taking out enemy combatants all around them completely suppressing the fire but at some point the aircraft overhead ran out of fuel and had to leave and at that point the surviving enemy combatants which still numbered in the hundreds they popped their heads up and they unleashed a hellacious volley of fire in which roy again got shot clean through the leg and so now Roy's looking around and he's realizing they're pretty much out of options. They don't have aircraft overhead. Roy's basically out of ammunition and there's no dead guy's guns around for him to grab. All of his team members are basically on the brink of death. And so Roy's thinking to himself, any minute now, we're gonna get overrun. And so he crawls to each of his surviving teammates and he gives them one last shot of morphine to at least make their death painless. And then at the 11th hour, another helo comes blazing into the jungle and opens fire on the enemy, pushing them back. Roy is immediately invigorated and motivated because now he sees an opportunity to potentially survive this. And so once again, he grabs his teammates and begins schlepping them over to the helicopter. And after he believed he got the last of them on board, he turned and saw two of his teammates had fallen down farther back in the jungle and the enemy was closing in on them. And so Roy, like always, without any hesitation, just starts running towards them. And as he's just about to reach them, an enemy soldier that had apparently run out of ammunition leapt out of the jungle and smashed Roy on the side of the head with their rifle butt, fracturing his skull. And so Roy falls to the ground and the soldier jumps on top of him and smashes his face, breaking his jaw. And then the soldier turns his rifle around. There's a bayonet on the front side and he begins impaling Roy over and over again. And Roy, like out of a movie, grabbed the rifle pulled it out of himself 
threw the soldier on the ground, jumped up, got on top of him, drew his Bowie knife, and proceeded to kill this soldier. And after he was done with that, who is this guy? <laughs> Yo, who, who, who? They don't make people like that no more. I feel like I, I feel like we all should be made of what Roy is made of, bro. What? I'm I'm speechless, fam. Like Terminator. Like, uh, uh, huh? Pulls out after getting st. Okay. All right. This dude here. He ran over to the two down men. He grabbed one of them with his left hand. He picked up a rifle with the other. And as he's dragging this guy back to the chopper, he shoots and kills two more enemy combatants. So he finally gets this guy back to the chopper. He runs back, gets the last guy, throws him back in the helicopter. And then finally, Roy is the very last living American to hop in the helicopter and the helicopter takes off. On the helo ride back, Roy was in very rough shape and had to literally hold his insides inside of his stomach. And so when they finally landed back at base, and Roy was hauled off of this helicopter. He wasn't moving, and the doctors and nurses didn't really even know where to start with him. He had so many injuries. He had 37 significant holes in his body from gunshot wounds, from bayonet wounds, from shrapnel. And so they started trying to treat him, but there was no heartbeat, no pulse, and so they declared him dead. Roy's body was moved into a body bag, and as the doctor was zipping it up again, Roy spit in his face because Roy had no other way to communicate. His jaw was... This dude, this dude right here, this dude right here, like, they're zipping the body bag up, bro. No, 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 no. Make sure you hear me clearly, right? Like, I, I literally want to just smash my laptop. I, I don't know why right now, but I, maybe I got some of Roy's adrenaline in me right now. Like, I, I just need to tear something up or, or they're zipping the body bag up, bro. Meaning they declared him dead. It's over. Nothing else I can do. You know all the things that the medical professionals say when they declare people dead. It's nothing else we can do. Tried our best. You know, he was he was succumbed to his wounds. We need to contact his next of kin. All of that. so badly broken from that rifle butt, he couldn't move his jaw, and his eyes were sealed shut from all the blood on his face that had dried. And so his only way to communicate was to spit. And so unbelievably, Roy was still alive. And so they took him out of the body bag and they shipped him to Japan for intensive surgery. And then he was transferred to Texas where he spent a year rehabbing from his severe injuries. Roy was immediately given the Distinguished Service Cross and was put in for the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is the US military's highest award for valor. But the paperwork took a really long time. And so Roy was not actually given the Congressional Medal of Honor until 1981. Of the 12 men that were trapped in that jungle, eight would survive, all thanks to Roy Benavides. Thank you. No, 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 no. I'm gonna clap too. And I know this is older. I, this man here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Y'all should be clapping too, bro. You know what I'm saying? If we could only be half of what Roy was. Bro. Roy Benavides. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of people call me a hero. I appreciate the title. But the real heroes are the ones that gave their life for this country. Roy passed away in 1998 as a result of complications from diabetes. He was 63 years old. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. Man. And I think we might have briefly touched on that story before. Um, and maybe one of those other type of videos we watch. You know, we watch so many, man. We might have. But no, bro. That dude. That dude. Him, Roy, I'm not going to even mess his last name up because he doesn't deserve that. His name needs to be said perfect every single time. So I'm just going to stop at Roy. 
bro like you can only wish you only wish that that you could be like that bro you know what i'm saying salute to him salute to everybody who's given their life for this country salute to everybody who served just salute to you guys period man you know what i'm saying these are stories bro these are, these are just some of those stories man that i don't care when you tell them where you tell them man they're always gonna be you know what i mean it's just gonna always captivate us me i can only speak for me hearing that is gonna captivate me bro and it's just gonna be like oh my gosh bro oh my gosh like if you like i felt like i don't even deserve to be in that man's presence you know what i'm saying but uh y'all get at me in the comment section man yet if mr ballin is kicking out videos like this and 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 stuff that's gonna keep me glued to my seat like this then i'm with it you know what i'm saying so uh yeah i i appreciate y'all for turning me on to the channel man salute to him salute to y'all until the next reaction of my peace y'all stay solid hey